I was listening to a podcast recently that said people are inherently bad at managing risk. And you know what? Business owners are no different. Latest research shows that 75% of business owners do not have an emergency disaster plan. So we're going to talk about that today. Stay with me. I'm here to tell you that all of SBAM's products and services are designed to save you time and money or offer you a product that may usually be reserved for much larger companies. A dividend eligible workers' compensation program is a perfect example of how SBAM and the buying power of our 28,000 members from across Michigan can bring you a product that may not be normally be available in the small business community. SBAM's Accident Fund Group Program provides an upfront premium discount and is dividend eligible. When Accident Fund's customers belong to an SBAM group, their business receives several benefits, including 5% upfront savings on their premium, opportunity for those dividend payments based on lost history, there's no minimum premium to qualify, and they offer convenient billing options as well as access to flyers, tip sheets, posters, and more through their online resource library. We invite you to check out all of our time and money saving products and services by visiting our website. If you have any questions, please give me a call at 800-362-5461. Well, thank you and welcome to the show today. We're talking with Katie Crick from Cedar River Insurance and Lieutenant Michelle Sosinski, Michigan State Police Emergency Management and Homeland Security Division. Wow, what a title that is. And what a guest as well. Uh, Katie, you're a regular contributor. I just want to say we feel really honored to have you here, Lieutenant Sosinski. Thank you very much. And Lisa, please, from here on out, call me Michelle. Oh, well, thank you very much. I'd love to do that. Uh, Glad you could join us. We have had quite a recent future here. Business owners have been dealing with, I mean, we, we came from a roaring economy into a total shutdown. And during all of that, in the recent past year, we've had a a horrific snowstorms in places that you never could imagine. Uh, And now we're dealing, of course, with um, what else happens in the rest of the year. So I thought it would be really timely. I think a lot of business owners are really looking forward to this great economy that we are enjoying again. And it might be a really good time to start to think about accidents, emergencies, hazards, disasters do happen. So this is not something that's going to come at us. This is something that is happened. It's here. It's continuing. And let's put some plans in place this time. Let's not get caught unawares. So let's set the stage here, uh, Michelle. Just tell us a little bit about what you think um, should a business do to prepare for emergencies and disasters? Well, businesses and their staff do face uh, a variety of hazards, some of which you've already talked about, and they happen all the time on an annual basis. There are things that they have to be concerned with that could happen. Um, Things, just natural hazards like floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes. We don't get some of those things very often or really ever, but they are still things that have to be on our radar and and we have to prepare for them. Health hazards, such as a widespread or serious illness, what we have going on right now, the pandemic, but even just a flu season is something that we have to prepare for. Human-caused hazards, including accidents and and acts of violence, Uh, and then technology-related hazards like power outages and equipment failures are things that can happen and and we have to be prepared. Uh, There's a lot that business leaders can do to prepare for, um, prepare their organization for these kinds of hazards. One of the first things that a business should do is identify what hazards they are most at risk for because it is very difficult to plan for all of these hazards that I just talked about. So you look at what is the risk that something is going to happen and then the what the consequences are. Those are the two main factors in, in determining what your highest risks are. Well, excellent. So Katie, we've been pummeled 
in the last year and a half. What, what do you have to say about all of this bad news that we just got through? Oh my gosh. Oh, I love several points that Michelle made and especially her point about looking at the likelihood of a risk and how severe that risk could be if it were to happen. Those are two really important concepts to sort of use as um, a barometer for how much attention to put and how to prioritize that approach. But the good news is that a business owner who undergoes an assessment, as she's describing, is going to kill two birds with one stone. And one of those birds in this case is their premium, their claims premium. Um, Because if you are reducing the likelihood of apparel coming against your business, you are going to naturally reduce the premium that you're paying over time because you're reducing your likelihood of a claim. Additionally, there are insurance companies that are so strict about their eligibility that they won't even offer coverages to organizations who don't have those plans in place. So at least you can know that you are reducing your likelihood of a risk naturally and and also um, opening up yourself to more market options. You know, that's fascinating. I hadn't thought about that from the perspective of actually reducing claim cost Mm -hmm. or reducing, yeah, your cost. Let me say to business owners, one of the things, this is my lesson learned. So I'm just a small business owner. That's why I do the show. That's who I'm talking to. It, you know, I came from the place where you don't do remote workers, people, you know, my clients want to know, do I have a building? Does my staff work in that building? And I've always been very resistant to uh, having a remote workforce. However, Now, as we've been remote for so long and everybody's thinking about not being remote, should we be remote? Some employees think it's a benefit. Some think they can't wait to get back to the office. But as I think about that, I think that just saying that having this ability to be remote may indeed help you stay in business if a hazard comes. So maybe you don't let go of all of that preparedness that you just put in place in case something happens. Now we can work remotely, right? So let me just say that as a caution, because it's something I'm thinking about. We're going to keep all of the things that we have had in place, regardless of what happens with our, you know, with our building. So what are some other things that a business leader can do to determine those hazards? Well, a risk assessment is a process to identify potential hazards. And analyze what could happen if that hazard occurs. So that is really what kind of what we're talking about. That's what um, a a business leader would want to do. Um, And like you've already talked about, a remote workforce are the assets for most businesses, I would think, certainly for the state police, but I would think for most companies, the biggest asset are its people, are its employees. So that's the biggest thing that we have to be concerned with. And um, you know, one of the biggest things that we're concerned with is life safety. So of course, our people are what we're most concerned with. Um, but injuries are the biggest consideration, uh, however that might happen. So it's got to be the consideration with a risk assessment. Um, hazard scenarios that could cause significant injuries should be highlighted. So those are the things that should be at the very priority of the list and how to address those. Um, And maybe as you talk about remote work, that needs to be a part of the plan as well, because things can certainly happen at home too. And if they are, you know, on the clock at home, then what about accidents that happen there? So it's just part of that whole preparedness plan, I think. Um, and, And understanding of what can happen will enable you to determine resource requirements and, um, fully, you know, definitely uh, properly develop the plans so that um, you have procedures in place and everyone is aware of what those procedures are. Now, Michelle, I understand what you're saying that you need procedures, you need to do an assessment, you have to have things in place. What if I'm unsure about performing those uh, risk, risk, what, what is a risk? Like, I don't really know how to do a risk assessment. I mean, I could say, am I in a flood zone? Am I you know, in a tornado alley, what have you, but is there a place that I can go to find out how to do that for myself? Certainly. I mean, some things are common sense. I think, you know, we as homeowners and parents and things like that, you, you typically think of, think of things like, 
um, fire, it, being able to evacuate for a fire or being able to shelter in place for a tornado, but some specialized resources that I think really get into the detail, the granular detail that you're asking. Um, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency has uh, some great tips and they have some risk assessment uh, tools on their preparedness website. And that is ready.gov slash business. So, I mean, they've already laid things out in a template format for businesses to go ahead and take a look at. And I think that that's a great um, solution for, you know, smaller businesses. If you don't have 2000 employees, you might, you might be able to do this yourself. Do you think that mm -hmm. though, that are there like professional risk assessment companies out there that come in and help you do that? Oh, sure. I'm sure that you know of these uh, small business contractors, but yes, there are. And a lot of times, I mean, honestly, retired law enforcement is a, they, you can even find them uh, online um, just by Googling, you know, your area, you would be able to find someone to help you. Or if uh, you as a business owner had a friend in law enforcement, they can give you easily some tips on to get started and maybe even drive you towards this website where, um, you know, FEMA specializes in this. So that's where I really would, that's the quick, easy and inexpensive way for any company to get started. I did not know about that FEMA website. That's good stuff. Katie, I bet you have more on kind of the, the who can help Part. Like, I, sure, I do. What thoughts about adding to this process do you have? I know you work with all different kinds, sizes, shapes, all different kinds of industries. I do. And I feel like the, this roundtable is such a testament to how important it is to have different experts from different sectors at the table and, and just seeing how much overlap there is and how similar we really are at, at our core. Um, a beauty of doing your insurance portfolio correctly is that during the application process and the underwriting process, you will be taken through these assessments. And consider the fact that aside from yourself as a business owner, there isn't really another partner that has more skin in the game of you not having a loss than your insurance company. <laughs> right, your banker, right? <laughs> right? Correct, right? And so, at the end of the day, it's the insurance company that financially will absorb the majority of a loss as much as you can hope, right? And so, they have an interest in helping you prevent these things from happening. I do want to make one kind of clarification. When I use the term hazard, I'm talking about it perhaps in a different way than the police would be using it. So, in the insurance industry, a, a peril is the event that causes the loss. So a tornado, an earthquake, a pandemic, those are all perils. And you want to make sure that your insurance policy covers as many perils as you can. We're talking about a hazard though. A hazard is a condition that can create a likelihood of a loss or exacerbate the damage that a loss is. So for us, reducing hazards are physically making sure there's not a hole in your roof. Are your doors locked? Do you have passwords to your computer, right? So insurance comes into play when you are doing your best and have eliminated as many hazards as possible, but the peril still comes. Got it. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't think that most business people would have spoken about it in that way. So learn a great deal every time I talk to you. Um, okay, so let's move this into now we have a plan. You've determined, you've removed hazards, you've determined perils, and you're, and now what do you do? I have a plan. Is it in writing? Is it on the computer in the cloud? Does my attorney have it? Where does, what happens now? Well, once you've identified, then your next step is to create um, your actual plan. So you've done the risk assessment, you have the plan, however you are gonna be able to get to that plan is up to you. Now, yes, I would, I would certainly think of the cloud or you know on your desktop, wherever you might need it. I would definitely want a printed version as well because we know technology. If we didn't know technology before this pandemic, we certainly know it now and how often it can go down. So even just with natural hazards that can happen. But you know, if there was something like that happening, you'd want to be able to get to your plan. But honestly, the time to 
get to your plan is not when that hazard is occurring. So that you don't just grab something off the shelf and look at it when a tornado strikes. You have to know what to do uh, by that time. So at the very least, you should be developing and implementing a plan to protect not only your employees, but people that enter the facility, any contractors or people that you would have coming in. So those are the your main players and you should be familiarizing them with that plan through training. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be a part of writing the plan, but once it's there, they should know what the, what the plan is through training and uh, looking at the procedures, understanding the procedures, following the procedures through drills and exercises. So um, just like in school, when we had to do fire drills or shelter in place uh, for tornadoes, that's what business that's what businesses should be doing as well with their employees, because if you've never practiced, if you've never even talked about what you would do in the case of, you know, a, a fire in the building, yeah, you might have it posted in certain, you know, specific places and point that out to people. But if you've never practiced it under times of stress, that's when people, unless you've practiced it, you won't go back to, uh, what you learned in training if you were never trained to begin with. So I think we're and all seeing that. Here, in- Michelle, I, I love what you're saying. And that's so crucial about having this plan, practicing the plan in advance. And, and I just want to maybe add to that business owners and, and anybody, they're reacting to an emergency disaster and they're kind of in their lizard brain. So, and during the planning process, what is so critical is to make sure that you're looking at business continuity in, in the response and, and after. So your plan really shouldn't just stop where, you know, the tornado is past our house now. It really needs to go into the weeds of how do we continue to deliver our product and our service despite conditions that might last for a long time. There, there is business interruption coverage in your insurance policy where you can try to recover some lost business revenue, but really the cost of losing customers, you can hardly even put a price on that. So the plan should continue along to what, what do we need to do? What functions are critical to the delivery of our product or service so that if we are not able to operate in our physical location for any period of time, you know, what can we do to continue that service? Can I add one more thing? Because I actually have something to add here from my own industry perspective, Put a communications plan in the preparedness plan. So who who communicates to customers and how? And who communicates to employees and how? So I think that that's sort of important. We have something called a crisis communication plan in, in the in the communications industry. Uh, so do think about that little piece of it as well. So yeah, I didn't mean to bring us off track there, but... Um, no, that's a, it's a great point. And, and again, I think small business owners know this is true that entrepreneurship can really be pretty lonely. And sometimes you, you know, you feel like maybe you don't have somebody to really rely on or to help you with these things. And thinking about your customer's perspective is something that businesses have, I think, relearned and relearned and relearned <laughs> this whole time. So communicating with them is so important too. Yeah. Certainly. We just have time for one more question. And I want to say, um, you know, if, if you would have had a plan 18 months ago, your plan probably wouldn't be the same today. So, because, you know, we've had a whole other world with, uh, you know, the pandemic. So now you might be planning for that kind of an event. How often should you review this? Give us that little bit of information. The short answer is routinely. Can't even say annually because we just don't know, like you said, when it, when something can happen. So, but what you should really focus on is familiarizing your staff with the plans through training and exercise. Um, and then that way, through that training and exercise, they will see, you'll see what the good and the bad came out of that. And then you can continue to tweak your plan based on what, what the outcome was. Excellent. and what you want it to be. Sure. Katie, any final thoughts from you? 
I do just one tidbit that within the insurance contract, the, the consumer has a responsibility to do all they can to mitigate loss to the extent possible. So if you are undergoing a loss, just make sure that you don't just abandon the ship, right? Do everything that you can to reduce the severity of a loss and it will pay off dividends in the end. Excellent. What about you, Michelle? Anything else you want to add? Just one thing I'd like to add in closing. First of all, thank you for having me. But also um, one additional thing I forgot to add as an additional resource that's local is uh, every community has a local emergency manager. So that could be someone to reach out to or your local fire department, especially if you have chemicals on site or anything like that, you want them to be a part of your plan. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is Denise Policello with Focus on Legal. Now the pandemic may have forced remote work on us, but now that we're starting to come out the other side and remote work orders will soon be lifted, it is time for employers to start considering adding remote work into their long-term planning and practice. This is because we need objective criteria from which to work as business owners so that we don't inadvertently suffer from unintended legal actions based on subjective decisions we may be tempted to make right now based on who's currently working from home and not who should be working from the place of business. The first thing you want to do is add an objective definition of remote work to your employee handbook. Now, I don't generally recommend changes to employee handbooks ever. I believe they are very static documents that should be rarely amended. However, in this circumstance, I do believe it's important to add an objective definition of remote work in there for all of your employees to see and read and reference because this is a change to the terms and conditions of employment. Second, you should be sitting down and objectively considering which positions, not people, are required to work from your place of business. In-person work is an essential job function that should be included in every job description where it is required. This will allow you to have objective conversations with employees and be transparent about who has to work from the office and who does not. As far as who has to work from the office, anybody that was coming to the office regularly um, pre-pandemic with no problems should not have any problems coming to the workplace post-pandemic every day. Now, it may have become a convenience and a benefit to not only your employees, but for you. And if that is the case and you see the remote work or hybrid workplace as a benefit to you as well, either through morale, cost savings, productivity, or whatever, then by all means include it as a benefit in the benefit section of your employee handbook. But be clear to your employees that it is not a right. It is a benefit that can be removed by you for business necessity in the future. Remember, objectivity and deed and policy is the key here, and always consult a qualified Michigan employment attorney. Focus on Law, brought to you by Pochella and Associates, PLLC. Hi, I'm Katie from Cedar River Insurance. At this point, I think that business owners, decision makers across all organizations are pretty tired of hearing about the reality of cybersecurity. (laughs) And I hate to beat a dead horse, but the piece of cyber insurance is so crucial. You need to make sure that your organization has a solid cyber insurance strategy. Cyber insurance is not just laden within your business owner's policy. You need to seek out cyber insurance, and there are several layers that you want to make sure you're looking for, especially one if you are a cloud-based business or use the cloud at all. There are real limitations to the amount of insurance available to protect you if the cloud has been compromised, so make sure you're addressing that within your strategy. You might also think that because you don't host or retain customer PII that you don't need good cybersecurity insurance, but think about how your business uses technology. If your systems are locked and you can't process customer payments for a day, two days, three days a week, what kind of lost revenue are you looking at? This is an area that good cybersecurity insurance can address too. Also, the cost of data reconstitution. So 
think about even if you have a good backup, it's possible to lose upwards of 20% of your company's data if you have a cyber attack. So there's tremendous cost associated with reconstituting data. And your cyber insurance strategy is a huge part of making sure that you're financially solvent again. Also realize that your cyber insurance company has a real vested interest in minimizing the amount of loss that you sustain. So as soon as you're hit with a cyber attack, your insurance company is one of the first partners you want to bring in because they are the ones who are going to have lines of communication to pay hackers if that's the case, but also bring in experts to mitigate the loss that you're sustaining. So don't neglect the cyber insurance piece of your total insurance strategy. I'm Katie with Cedar River Insurance. Thanks. Focus on insurance. Brought to you by Cedar River Insurance. Currently, two things are colliding. First, it's income tax time. And secondly, cryptocurrency values have literally gone through the roof. And because of that, the IRS is taking a look at this situation far more seriously than ever and it wants to collect its due. You know, recently it required an exchange to provide the data on more than 14,000 of its customers' activity. And it's warned taxpayers that if you've been involved in crypto, you better take a look at your returns and amend them to properly reflect your transactions. It said too that it's using advanced analytics now to take a look at your returns, bank transactions, and sources of other information because it intends to stay on top of this and collect its due. But making sure that you have the information that you need to make sure that you're not overtaxed is another story. Because unlike banks and brokerage firms that keep vital information for you and provide that to you, those entities that are involved in cryptocurrency exchanges and trading are not universally obligated to track or provide that transactional information to you. And nonetheless, this is exactly what you need to make sure you're not overtaxed. And if you don't have it, guess what? The IRS or some other authority is going to assign numbers to your return and you're not gonna like the result. So if you don't have the necessary information, you better start to reconstruct it and you better keep it from this day forward. Now, if you've been involved in cryptocurrency, it's necessary for you to go into your financial details in detail with your tax professional. If you need more information about this particular topic or others, please go to our website and make the request. You can also request a consultation with us at that time. Thanks. I'm attorney Richard Craig Krause. Have a good day. Focus on Tax, brought to you by Kraus, Bangs, and Associates PC. Build a better marketing strategy with Inverve Marketing. The way we buy has changed. It's time to dream bigger. With digital marketing, you can build your business faster, measure and evaluate results. Let us help you find your marketing superpowers with inbound marketing, driven by strategy with inspired creativity. Why not put some verve in your brand? Market and grow better with Inverve Marketing. The executive producers of Focus on Business are looking for your stories. Stories from owners of established businesses that have come through amazing adversity, bucked the odds, found the next big thing. If you have a story, we want to hear from you. Go to our website and maybe we'll invite you onto the show. Mm -hmm.